We uh, work through our sermons here. The way that we preach here at First Baptist Church is we preach exegetically, which means we're going verse by verse through a, a book of the Bible. We're looking at every verse, and this has some, some great advantages to it. Uh, for me as a pastor, I'm not choosing what I'm preaching on. God has already laid that out. God has laid out in advance the order of the scriptures, and we're preaching exactly what God's word says. And that's what we're doing. Um, and so I don't have to, to wonder, oh, what am I going to preach on next week? I don't have to wonder, um, you know, is somebody going to be offended that I'm preaching on this? I'm just going to preach what the word of God says and let God work through it. He tells us that his word is going to go out and it's not going to come back void of what he sent it to do. So as I proclaim God's word today, uh, you guys have some advantages in it as well. And being that we're preaching exegetically, you know what we're going to preach on next week. You know that today as we wrap up chapter 11, next week we're going to start chapter 12. And so, guess what? You get some homework. You get to read ahead. It's like knowing what next week's test is going to be on in school and, and getting to read ahead and prepare for it beforehand. So I want to encourage you guys, since we are finishing chapter 11 uh, this week, to read into chapter 12 throughout the week. Prepare yourself for next week's sermon. Get ready for that. Come next week prepared and ready to receive the word of God, receive what God has laid on Pastor Greg's heart as he starts chapter 12. And this is one of the, the greatest benefits of preaching exegetically, is you know where we're going, you know what's coming, you can read ahead and you can get into that. But today, uh, we are going to finish chapter 11. We're going to read uh, verses 26 through 33 in Mark chapter 11. If you would, stand with me as we read these verses together. It says, And they came again to Jerusalem, and he was walking in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But shall we say, from man? They were afraid of the people, for they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus said to them, neither I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Let's pray. Father God, as we examine your word this morning, and we examine this challenge to your authority in the temple courts, we pray that you are leading us into the truth that's contained here. Father, that you are illuminating the scriptures to us. You're showing us exactly what it is we should take away from this and exactly how we can apply this truth to our life. Father, reveal this truth to us today. Let us not ever question your authority in our lives. Let us humbly serve you and humbly submit to your will in our lives, Lord. Father, we ask that you lead us into this today through the Holy Spirit. Fill this place with your presence as we study your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I was in the Air Force for um, about eight years. Uh, not a super long time, but I, I loved being in the Air Force. I loved what I did. I loved uh, working on ejection seats. That was my job. I was an egress mechanic. And so I worked on ejection seats. I worked with my hands a lot. And God really blessed me in my time in the Air Force. He blessed my career. He lined it up uh, so that I could really work in the right positions, have the right jobs. I had some great supervisors, some great people who kind of mentored me and showed me how I should work. God blessed me with a great work ethic. And he really just kind of lined up my Air Force career for success. Well, several years ago, some of this success had been recognized a little bit, and I was given an award. Uh, it wasn't anything extremely special. I was a uh, non-commissioned officer of the quarter, NCO of the quarter. Uh, so I received this award, and the flight, uh, which is the next level above where I worked, I worked in a section, the flight was above that. The flight supervision came down to my shop to, to honor me with this award. And they did it in front of your peers, they do it in front of the people that you work with so everyone can kind of see 
you know, it's kind of one of those morale things. We want everybody to work hard, so we're going to give an award in front of everybody so that they can all strive to be better. Something silly like that. But the, the flight brought all of the important people down. The flight chief comes down, the assistant flight chief comes, the superintendent, they all come down to, to the work section where I was to give me this award. And the superintendent's the one who gives the award, and he's an officer. So as he walks up to give me the award, I have to go to attention. I go to attention, and he comes up, and he gives me the award. He hands it to me. He thanks me for my hard work. I salute him, and he turns around, and he walks away. And the whole time this is happening, the only thing that I am thinking is, who is this little kid? Who is this guy that they sent down here to give me an award? He's so young. How is he so young? I, d I didn't get it. Like, he was, I mean, maybe 16 is what he looked like. I, I didn't understand. And the whole time I'm thinking, what makes this man think that he has the authority to give me an award? He's probably been in the Air Force for all of four days. He doesn't know anything about what's happening. He woke up this morning and the flight chief came and said, hey, we're going to go give Truax an award today. This man doesn't know anything. Why does he think he has the authority to give me an award? Now, I thought these things. I didn't say any of them. If I had said them, I wouldn't be having a great Air Force career. But this was what was going on in my mind. And realistically, this man was probably 22 years old. He was a, a young lieutenant, had probably just graduated college, had probably done ROTC through all of college. He had already done his, his OCS and all of that. But he really did. He looked like he was 16 years old. And here I am. I, I think I was about 25 years old or so and had been in the Air Force for like seven years. And here's this guy who's, who's walking in. Um, I'm like, man, why does this man think that he has the authority to do anything? He's so young. Well, you see, Jesus' authority was challenged as well. And while his is significantly more than mine, I think we've all been in that situation where we've looked at something and, and really challenged the authority that somebody has over us. And we see for Jesus, he, is, uh, he and his disciples had been staying out in Bethany. And so at the end of each day, they would walk out to Bethany from Jerusalem. They would go outside the city. He had just entered into Jerusalem a few days before on, on Sunday. And when he entered into Jerusalem, he was welcomed in as the coming king. He had this great welcoming. And since then, he's cursed the fig tree, which withered to its roots and died. And then he taught on that. He's cleansed the temple and completely shook up the temple system that everybody has known for so long. And it really caused a stir and caused a lot of people to get upset with him. And you know this is a big deal because in verse 27 of Mark, it says that the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him. Now, they came to him while he was walking in the temple. And what you see here is this picture of Jesus walking through the temple, and he was probably teaching as he walked around. And he's teaching, and people are gathering, and they're listening to him teach. And really, the temple was kind of set up for this. It had these big, wide-open spaces for teachers or for rabbis to come and to teach. And they could walk around and talk, and people would gather and listen while they were teaching. Now, the temple was set up for this, but it wasn't able to do this before Jesus cleansed the temple. Because the temple courts were filled with people selling things and exchanging money and doing all of these things that were not intended to happen in the temple. And so Jesus had just cleansed them, wiped them out, turned over the tables, made everybody mad, and now he was able to do this. He was able to walk through the temple and to teach. But while he was doing it, he was approached by these three, approached by these three groups of people. And they were upset with what Jesus had done. And these, the, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders, these three groups of people make up the Sanhedrin. This was really the, the, uh, the whole council of the temple. This was set up under the leadership of Ezra in the time of Nehemiah, even before the walls around the city were restored. This group of men have been established for a very long time, and they were very upset at what Jesus had done. And total, there were about 71 people who were on this council. That's a big group of officials. And really, it was the high court of the Jews is what this was. And so the high court comes to Jesus. And when they do this, you can see the seriousness of what Jesus had done. 
the seriousness of Jesus cleansing the temple. Now, not many, or all these people were so angry with Jesus that they wanted to have him arrested. And they could have. They could have arrested him on the spot. But they didn't. They didn't arrest him. Instead, they came to him and they questioned his authority. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you the authority to do them? See, Jesus had amassed quite a following at this point. There were a lot of people who were going with Jesus. They were listening to him teach. He had performed many miracles, many signs that he was the Son of God. And the people who were there listening to him teach it was so large that when the Sanhedrin came to him, came to Jesus, they were afraid of what these people might do. And so they decided, I'm not going to arrest him. What we'll do instead is we will discredit his authority. We will discredit Jesus. Now, this is something that our culture still does today. When they want to downplay the importance of Christianity, they discredit Jesus. When they want to downplay the importance of church, the importance of God's word, the importance of the truth that's contained in there, and the influence that that should have on our culture, they try to discredit it. They try to point to the fact that it's not important. And these men did the same thing. They come to discredit Jesus in hopes that people would stop following him and they would be able to arrest him. In their eyes, this was a win-win. If Jesus comes up and he says, yes, I'm operating on the authority of God, they could arrest him on the spot. Because these men, the Sanhedrin, had taken it upon themselves and taken this self-given job to confirm all of the prophets, which they hadn't done with Jesus. They hadn't confirmed him as a prophet. So if he says, yes, I'm operating under the authority of God, they haven't confirmed him, they can arrest him and throw him in jail. If he says that his authority comes from man, the people are going to leave him because they believe that he is the Son of God. And so for them, it's win-win. It doesn't matter how Jesus responds. At the end of this question, they can arrest him and throw him in jail. They're like, boom, gotcha, we're done. Jesus, here's the question. However, Jesus, having been kind of in this point before, they've tried to trap him many times. Jesus knows exactly how to get out of it. And he responds to them and he says, I'll ask you one question. Answer me and I will tell you by what authority I do this. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? And then he says, answer me. Now, believe it or not, there is an answer contained in Jesus' response. There's an answer in the question that he asks. The Sanhedrin just refused to acknowledge it. But I'll get to that in a second. In our legal system today, we don't get to do what Jesus did. It doesn't fly. When a judge asks you a question, you don't get to ask a question back and demand something of the judge. That's not how it works. Our culture would never let that go. That's not how our legal system is established. Well, that doesn't work for the Sanhedrin either. You don't get to do this in the, the Jewish high court. You don't get to make demands of the ruling body. But Jesus does. And what he's doing is he is showing the Sanhedrin and he's showing all of the people who are with him, all of his followers, that he in fact has authority over them. He has authority over the Sanhedrin. Look at it. He demands an answer to his question. He says, answer me, demanding this answer from them. He makes a demand of this, this legal counsel in the Jewish culture in the temple, of all places to do it, he's standing in the temple and makes a demand of the Sanhedrin. Now, only those who are in authority can make a demand and expect a response. Jesus is demonstrating to us his authority over these people. And he's answering a question that he's already answered before. Jesus has been asked of his authority before. It's been questioned and answered previously. And if you look in Luke chapter 5, you see this narrative of a paralyzed man who needs to be healed. And Jesus had been on his teaching ministry for a little while, had a, a lot of people who were following him, and he had come into town and everybody kind of swarmed to where he was to listen to him teach. And these four guys heard that Jesus was in town, and they had a friend who was paralyzed, and they knew that Jesus could heal him. 
So they went to their friend and they picked him up off of, in his mat. Four guys pick up their friend on his mat and they take him to Jesus. But when they get there, the building is too crowded for them to even get in. So they decide we're going to climb up this staircase. We're going to go to the roof. Can you picture this? Four guys carrying a mat with a paralyzed man on it, walking up a set of stairs on the outside of a house. It's not like our modern stairs. There aren't rails. There's no inspector coming in and telling them you need rails or anything like that. But these four guys climb up the stairs. They get to the roof, and they decide the best thing to do right now is to just dig a hole in the roof. It's a thatch roof. Not a big deal. We'll just dig a hole, and then we'll lower Jesus down. So that's what they do. They, they tear a hole in the roof. They lower, or not Jesus, but the paralyzed man. <laughs> that, that would have been a really weird analogy. But... <laughs> They lower the paralyzed man down from the roof in the middle of the crowd, right to where Jesus is. Everybody sees this. I mean, that's something you notice when someone rips a hole in the roof of the building you're in. Everybody sees this. And Jesus turns to the man and looks at him, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. A paralyzed man who can't move, probably never walked before. Jesus sees him, and the greatest need that Jesus sees is that his, need, his sins need to be forgiven. And so he says, your sins are forgiven. Now also present at this time are some scribes and some Pharisees, guys who really know the word of God, guys who know the law of God. And they start to question Jesus. And they said, who has the authority to forgive sins but God alone? And Jesus hears and knows that they're questioning them. And he looks at them and Jesus just basically says, so that you know that I have the authority to forgive sins? He looks back at the paralyzed man, says, stand up, take your mat, and go. And this man stands up, probably for the first time in his life, picks up his mat and walks out. See, Jesus answered the question on whose authority he's operating right then in Luke 5. If God is the only one who has the authority to forgive sins, and Jesus has just forgiven sins, he's either God or operating on the authority of God, or both in Jesus' case. Jesus has answered this question before, but that doesn't stop him from answering it again. In his question that he posed back to the Sanhedrin, to the legal council, he points to an answer to the question. He asks about the ministry of John the Baptist. He asks if that bap his baptism, really speaking of the outward sign of John's ministry, if that baptism was from man or from heaven. Now I want to take a second to examine the ministry of John the Baptist and see how this points to an answer to where Jesus' authority comes from. We see in Mark chapter 1, it says, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan. This was the ministry of John. It was ordained by God to prepare a way for the Lord. It's a fulfillment of prophecy that we see from the book of Isaiah. Now, John's ministry was something new. It was actually completely contradictory to the ministry of the temple. In the temple, for the forgiveness of sins, you had to offer a sacrifice. You had to, to make an offering for the forgiveness of sins. And John is saying, be baptized and repent for the forgiveness of your sins. It's contradictory. His baptism has its roots in the ceremonial washings uh, of the Old Testament. That idea is not something new. You can read on, on them in Leviticus 15 and other places, see kind of where the roots are, but it's the forgiveness part without a sacrifice. The Word of God even tells us that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. So what in the world is John doing, baptizing people and saying, repent and, and be forgiven? You see, John's ministry was a foreshadow of the times to come where we no longer were required to make a sacrifice because it's already been made for us. We were no longer required to shed the blood of something because this blood has already been shed for us. John's ministry was making straight the paths of the Lord by foreshadowing a time that was coming after Jesus was sacrificed on the cross. It was also reflecting what Jesus had just taught us when he was teaching us from the, the withered fig tree that all you need now is faith in God. This was John's ministry, to make straight the paths of the Lord. Let's look at the testimony of John. 
says, the next day he, speaking of John, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the testimony of John the Baptist. He also says later in the chapter uh, of John 1, he says, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him, speaking of Jesus. He who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John confirms that Jesus was sent by God. And God told him exactly what the sign would be of the one who's coming to operate on the authority of God. When Jesus was baptized by John, the, the heavens opened and the spirit descends like a dove and, and stops on Jesus, confirming that it is Jesus who has the authority of God. Also, the, the heavens declared, God spoke from heaven and said, this is my son with whom I am pleased. And you see, John's ministry points to Jesus, points to Christ, points to his authority. This answers the question that the, the Sanhedrin is asking. Jesus operated with the authority of God because it was God who sent him. And John the Baptist confirms this. But the, the Sanhedrin, these men who are questioning it, refuse to acknowledge it as an answer. So Jesus pointed them back to this event, but they refused to acknowledge it. If they don't believe that John's ministry was from God, are they really going to believe that Jesus' authority comes from God? Or if they do believe that John's ministry is from God, then they have to believe that Jesus was as well. And then there's no point of even asking the question because the testimony of John is that Jesus was sent from God. Jesus is operating on the authority of God. However, they decide, rather than take the truth for what the truth is, we'll discuss it amongst ourselves. It says, and they discussed it with one another, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But shall we say from man? They were afraid of the people, for they held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. We need to look at this. They reasoned with one another. They talked it out amongst themselves. These men were supposed to be the most religious ruling body that there was in all of Jerusalem. There was supposed to be nobody better connected with God than these men. Yet, when they were questioned on something, they don't turn to God for an answer. They turn to themselves. They try to talk it out amongst themselves. Now, this has been the downfall of their ministry since the very beginning since it was even established, as they take their eyes off of God. They take their eyes and they stop seeking where God is leading and they start leading where they think they're going. We try to do this ourselves. We try to reason amongst ourselves. We try to work through problems on our own. We say, if we say this, then this is going to happen. Or if we say this, then this is going to happen. We take our eyes off of God as well. These men saw that there was no good response to to Jesus' question. They tried to, to trap Jesus again, but he got them again. Now I want to talk about two things on this point. These men had no regard for the truth. They didn't want to know what was true. They only wanted to be right. And they allowed their fear of man to influence them to the point that their ministry was completely ineffective. So they had this fear of man we see it when they say, shall we say, from man. And then it says, they feared the reaction of the people. For they, and they being the group of men and women who were with Jesus and listening to him teach, that group of people held that John really was a prophet. They were afraid to, to contradict what the group of people said. They were fearing man. You have these men trying to catch Jesus and to discredit him Yet they feared what the people would say if they said that John the Baptist's ministry wasn't from God. These men were more afraid of the judgment of men than they were of the judgment of God. Their concern was with what people had thought of them. Maybe they feared that these, this group of people who were with Jesus would harm them if they said that John's ministry wasn't ordained by God. But we see in Proverbs that the fear of man lays a snare. 
Proverbs 29, the fear of man lays a snare. Now, these men came to trap Jesus, but it was them, they themselves that were put into a trap because the fear of man lays a snare. They had placed their fear of man above their fear of the Lord. They weren't concerned with whether or not Jesus had come from God, but they were concerned with the public opinion, what the public thought about them and their ministry. It was their job, at least in their eyes, to confirm and to commission the prophets and the ministers. And they hadn't commissioned Jesus. They were saying, you're not operating on our authority, so whose authority are you operating on? Their minds were not set on the things of God. If they were, they would have run the temple the way that God had told them to run the temple. But they were more concerned about what brought money into the temple rather than people. They were more concerned about what made money for the temple rather than making converts for God. Had they had their minds on the things of God, Jesus would have never had to cleanse the temple, run people out, and we wouldn't even be in the situation that we're in. Their minds were rather set on the things of this world. Romans 8.5 says that if you walk according to the flesh, then your mind is set on the things of the flesh. If you think about that the other way, if your, your minds are set on the things of the flesh, you're going to walk according to the flesh. And this is exactly what these men are doing. These men had their minds set on the thing of flesh, and they were afraid of what men thought. They had a fear of man. Jesus gives us some advice on our fear of man. He said, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. That's some sound advice for us. But the fear of man is more than just the fear of physical harm. The fear of man concerns itself with losing man's favor, losing man's love, goodwill, help, or friendship. This is the, the fear of man. And really, it's an idol of acceptance. We seek the approval of man for our comfort, for our acceptance and approval, and for our pleasure. It's an idol that leads us to compromise for the sake of acceptance, so that we would be accepted by those around us. And this is important because their fear of man led them to a complete disregard for the truth. The fear of man leads to a complete disregard for truth. Now, here's the truth of our culture today. You may not like it, you may have seen it before, you may know exactly what I'm talking about, but in today's culture, it's hard to deny. The world, man, they don't care what truth is. They don't care what God said and done. They don't care about any of that. In Romans 8, there's a clear difference between those who have their minds on the things of the flesh and those who have their minds on the things of the Spirit. And you cannot have both. To set your mind on the things of flesh, it says in Romans 8, is death. But to set your mind on the things of spirit is life and peace. And those who have their minds set on the flesh cannot please God. These men had a complete disregard for the truth. You, say it when, or you see it when they are reasoning with one another and they say, well, if we say this about John, this is going to happen. If we say this, this is going to happen. So we're just going to say that we don't know. There's no good answer. All that mattered was what people thought about them. All that mattered was that people thought that they were concerned with the truth. And when you fear something, or when you fear someone, you allow that to control you. And you can't live life abundantly. Now I want to just talk about one really quick indicator. Something in your life that will indicate to you if you have a fear of man. This isn't the only thing, but I think this is probably one of the most prevalent and easiest ways to determine whether or not you have a fear of man. And that is whether or not you have somebody that you confess your sins to. James 5 tells us that we need to confess our sins to one another. But the reality is most of us don't. We're afraid. We're scared of judgment. We don't want to be shamed in somebody else's eyes or shamed in our eyes. We're more concerned about that appearance than we are about the truth. A fear of man leads us to the point where we're not going to confess our sins to one another. 
Now, I'm not saying you need to confess your sins to everybody that you meet. That would be weird. The Walmart teller would know way too much about me. But you need to have somebody in your life that you confess your sins to. There needs to be that person. And if you don't have that person, I need you to listen to this next part of the sermon. This part is directly for you. Because if the fear of man leads to a complete disregard for the truth, which we've seen in this section, and that makes it impossible to please God, what are we to do? How are we to respond to that? Because we can't go on living that way. The first thing that we need to do is realize this. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. What can man do to me? God is not against you. He is always with you. The Lord is for me. Man can do nothing to harm you. That's why we have that, that advice that Jesus has given us. We know that the fear of man brings a snare. So we need to confess that sin. And once we have confessed our sin of having an idol of acceptance, we need to grow in our fear of the Lord. Psalm 34, 11 says, Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. When we're controlled by our fear, we're going to question the authority that God has over us. When we're controlled by the fear of man, we're not going to live according to God's word because we're more concerned about what man thinks and what man does. We will question the authority he has over us because we will look to man for the answers. We will try to reason amongst ourselves. However, when we fear the Lord, we will submit to his authority. So we need to grow in our fear of the Lord. We need to study his word. We need to learn more about him and about his character, about who he is and the authority that he has in our lives. We must grow in our fear of the Lord. Now, if this is, is you this morning, if this is something that you struggle with, this idol of acceptance, this fear of man, I would love to pray with you at the end of this service. I would love for you to come down and to pray with me and allow me the opportunity to pray with you. And I'm going to volunteer my deacons. Sorry, guys, you're on the hook. Uh, I'm going to volunteer them to pray with you as well. So maybe if you don't want to walk down and pray with me and let everybody see that, find one of our deacons, grab them, pray with them. This is why we're here. This is why God has given this congregation the pastors and the deacons and the elders and overseers that he has so that we can pray for you and shepherd you and minister to you. We all need to grow in our fear of the Lord, and some of us need help to do that. And this is what we're here for. So I'm going to close this in a word of prayer. As I pray, I invite our, our ushers to come down for the offertory. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you today that you have authority in our lives, that you are a God who cares about us enough to be intimately involved in our lives, to, to place yourself over us and to guide us and to, to direct us, Father. Your word tells us that you want what's good for us and that you are guiding us into that. Father, I submit myself to you today. I submit to your authority in my life. I pray for this congregation that they will examine their hearts and they will examine where they're at and where their fears are placed, Lord. And if they have a fear of man that they're allowing to control them, Lord, I pray they're going to surrender that to you. They're going to confess that sin to you. They're going to confess that sin to another believer, Lord. And I pray that they are going to grow in their fear of you. Father, we thank you that we get to, to be called your sons and daughters that we get to be adopted into your family. And I pray that we set our minds on the things of the spirit and not the things of the flesh. I pray that we never have a disregard for the truth, but we are always digging in your word, seeking the truth, longing after you. Father, I pray for these tithes and offerings that are gonna be given right now, Lord, that you would take them and receive them, that you would multiply them to go out into the world and to spread your gospel. Father, as we give back in this tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless this time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.